We do praise you, Father. We give you the glory. We love you. We don't understand why you love us sometimes, but we're so grateful that you do. You provide for us, you take care of us, you guide us, you direct us. You ask for the from us other than obedience and love. We come now to the time of our worshiping and praising you that we do so with the gifts that you give us so that we can return to you. We ask that you take these gifts, that you bless them, that you use them where they need the most, whether it be here in this church or in this city or this nation or some foreign country, Lord. And we would just give you the praise and the trust of the outcome in your son's name.
How powerful is your God? Something happened in your life this week that you just said, where are you, God? I don't think, didn't think God could take care of it. I, I look at our world and the situation we're in today and all of the things that are going on in our country. And I just, uh, God's still in control. He's still in control. And uh, a lot of things that are happening, we deserve. We cause the habit that God is still in control. One of, before we get into our scripture reading, I want to show you a little slide here. Can you put that up, please? There it is. Pray for us in Nigeria. And got a second over from, I guess it would be your right, with the big beard there. That's Justin, a member of our church, sitting over in Nigeria. Uh, they got to Nigeria and they wouldn't let them in. What? That happened. Some of them did get to go ahead and go in. And so he's on his way back home. And, uh, but as we said, God's in control, so there's a reason for it. And uh, we, we prayed for him. Uh, I got a uh, text from him this morning, and, and just like Justin, he is, he's, yeah, he's okay. He said, God, take control. And that was exactly, he was looking forward to the trip, to the mission trip and so forth. But he's got other mission trips he'll be going on, and so there's a reason he didn't get to go into Nigeria. So be in prayer for him. That's why his wife's not here this morning playing the cello. She went to pick him up at the airport. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 7, we'll read through verse 13. Let's stand together. Romans 15, verse 7. Wherefore, receiving one another, as Christ also received us to the Lord God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises that he made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto that name, unto thy name. And again he said, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall, write, shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with the joy of peace and believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning as we come together to worship and to praise and, and to uh, be convicted, if you will, Lord. We do thank you that we are able to open up your word, and in your word you have instruction. So may we pay attention to in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we've been going through Romans, and particularly this part here for the last couple of weeks, this is the end of Paul's argument in the book of Romans. We might say, if you will, this is a postscript to all that he's been trying to tell us, tell all the church, tell believers. And he started out by talking with the Jews. He began with the Jews and the problem with sin that they had. And then he continued unto the Gentiles and the same thing. Gentiles, you too have a problem with sin. Now Paul has taken these two separate groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, that have been separated in sin, their differences, you know, customs and all of that, and if they're believers in Christ, he's trying to bring them together to unity. Jews and Gentiles alike, you can worship together. And I think that's what God has to do with the church even today. I mean, there are, there are differences between uh, churches and groups and denominations and those kinds of things. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus prayed that they might be one. That we would worship and serve together. I think one of the reasons that we as believers, as Christians, don't have the political power or the social power or the power that we ought to have is because we're so scattered and so separated and thinking so many different kinds of, of things. And, and they're all minor things. But if we as believers could just get together, if we could unite, if we could have unity, then we could have a, a greater voice. But we don't do that. And so we're going through the book of Romans. He deals with sin, deals with the wrath of God, talks about salvation, God's plan, and then he goes into the principles to unity. When we looked at Romans chapter 12, we dealt with man's relationship to God. What should our relationship to God be while we're here on this earth? 
Then he went into the relationships with one another. Remember he talked about the gifts and the edifying and how we were to be here for one another. We all have different gifts and we put it together to, to encourage one another. And then he said, and the relation to everybody else. What kind of witness, what kind of testimony are we to be to the non-believer? We went to Romans chapter 13. We talked about the Roma or the Christian's relation to the government. How where do we, you know, what do we do? Render unto Caesar, render to Caesar, render unto God, what is God? He said the primary thing though is love. As believers, we need to make sure that we have love. Then he challenged us. He said, now that you've heard all of these things I've shared with you, you better go out and do it. Are we practicing Christians? Or do we just say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, I believe in His Word, I believe in His principles, but do we practice it in our daily life? Whether we're at work, at school, with neighbors, wherever we might be, we are to be practicing our Christian life. We are to walk Christ's life. And then we got to chapter 14, talking about Christian relationships, and what we're supposed to have, and how we're supposed to treat one another. And now he wants to talk about unity. So we get into chapter 15, and it's really broken into three divisions in chapter 15. He gives the basic instructions for unity. And that, of course, goes back to love. And we need to be concerned for one another. Gives us a biblical illustration of unity. And an intercession that comes as a result of unity. What does God do with a church, with a group of believers that, that get along, that love one another? That are carrying out his commandments. What can God do with that kind of church? Oh, I think if, if he could use it, it would be a powerful tool that God would use. And so that's where we want to be. All right. So that this morning, Paul wants to give another appeal, one last appeal for we as a church to be one, to have unity within the church. Because you see, Satan is trying to divide us, he wants to divide the church. Now we got peculiar ideas about this and particular things we like to do here. Some say this is all right, others say this isn't all right. And so Satan wants us to be divided, to not get along, for we couldn't even get together. It's sad to say that there are churches where, where there's literally a division in the middle of the church. And these people sit over here, and these people sit over here, they don't talk to one another. They don't have any kind of fellowship with one another. They can't work together. I'm so thankful for our church. I am so thankful for you that we can get along. Uh, the only reason you sit on this side and you sit on this side is because you've always done it. <laughs> I and sometimes when I shake your head and you're sitting in a different spot, I'm going to say, I don't know you were here today because I'm used to be sitting right here. But you know, it started with the early church. And the Christian Jew and the Christian Gentile. You had Jews who were getting, becoming Christians, you had Gentiles who were becoming Christians, and they, and they couldn't get along. I mean, food was a big problem and other kinds of things and so forth. So he deals with the mature Christian, and he says, you who are mature in Christ, you who understand what this is all about, go to the weaker brother and sister in Christ and help them, strengthen them, encourage them. Teach them those kinds of things. Try to get us to understand that, that importance of sweet fellowship. Look at uh, in chapter 15, look at verse 6. He said that you may be with one mind and one mouth, glorifying God, even the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to be our desire to be Christ like, to glorify the Father, to allow the Holy Spirit to dictate or show us what we need to be doing. And so that's his premise here. And it gives a basic instruction in verse 7. The basic instruction in verse 7. And he starts out with the word wherefore. Wherefore, now that we've heard all of these things, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. He said, receive one another. Wherefore, on the basis of something before that, then do this. We just read verse 6, which he said, be Christ-like, giving God the glory. Now that you're going to do that, receive. Now think about that word for a second. Receive. <coughs> what would you say is a definition to receive? I think what he's trying to say is receive here is give access to your heart. 
That's when you truly receive something. When you allow it, when you give access to your heart. He's not talking about, oh, just become a member of a group, a group of people. No, he said, literally let somebody get into your life. We talk about when somebody joins the church, we are receiving them into membership. Well, what we ought to be doing is saying, that person is now a part of my Christian life, my Christian walk. We're going to work together, we're going to share, we're going to do what God wants us to do. I am giving them access to my heart. And it's not just a welcome, it's not just a shaking of the hand and saying, I'm glad you're here, I'm glad you're a part of us. It's from the heart. It is we as believers allowing somebody to get involved in our life and get involved with what God is doing. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40, he says, He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. See what God is saying? Here is one of my children, somebody that has accepted me as Lord and Savior. And I want them to be a part of your life and you to be a part of their life. And then together you're a part of my life and me with you. That's what God is saying. I mean, it's simple. It's simple. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are believers. We're going to spend eternity together, so get along. Enjoy one another, appreciate one another, encourage one another, help one another. <laughs> when you're reaching out and open your heart to someone, you're reaching out to the Lord. You're opening your heart to the Lord. Well, but, but you know, I can't always agree with everybody. Now he's not thinking here, or he's not thinking about personality, or race, or minus, minor religious preferences. That's not what he's talking about here. When you seek the love of Christ and you're seeking to do His will, that ought to be enough for us to get along. The love of Christ. What does Christ want me to do? We ought to be able to get along with that. We ought to be able to be brothers and sisters in Christ. You remember last Sunday, again, we talked about the stronger need to get with the weaker and help him. But be careful, don't flaunt your liberty. Yes, I'm saved. And I'm saved by grace and the end. I don't live under the law anymore and, and I have liberty in Christ. But be careful you don't find it to where you cause somebody else a problem. Because I believe that what he's telling us here, that oneness is so important. I think the world sometimes look at churches and say, you know, uh, they, they don't even like each other. They, they constantly talk about the pastor and they talk about the staff and they talk about one another and they just don't even like each other. Why would I go to church? Why would I go to church? What needs to happen if somebody needs to walk in these doors back here and look at a church that there's genuine appreciation and love for one another? Not just for God, but for one another. They need to see that. So he talks about here in verse 6 and 7, the pattern of Christ. Stop thinking about that moment. The pattern of Christ. Is that an impossible standard for us to live? Be Christ-like? He says, love one another as Christ loves. Can we do that? How much does Christ love you? And every one of us. Shouldn't we love each other like that? Is it an impossible standard? Not if you said that's what we're supposed to do. How about this? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? He died for the church. He lives for the church. He blesses the church. And we as husbands need to love our wife that much. Impossible standard. Why? I mean, God said we're supposed to do it. How about this one? Be ye perfect as I am perfect. Whoa. Impossible standard. There's no way, God. There must be. The orchestra played about it this morning. The power of God. The greatness of God. And you saw all those pictures there and you said, wow, isn't God awesome? Yes, He is. And in your life, He can cause you to love one another as He loves. He can cause the husbands to love their wife as He loves the church. He can cause us to be perfect as He is perfect. If we let Him. That's the point. It's not God who is moved. We put up the barriers in certain areas of our life. 
And we say, I can only do this much. Break those barriers. Let God have 100% of your life. Let's see what God can do with you. Let's see what God can do with somebody that just says, okay. If Jesus could indiscriminately say, come unto me, shouldn't we be able to receive receive all who are willing? If somebody comes to Jesus, comes to the cross, regardless of their past, regardless of where they're at right then, if they genuinely come to the cross and confess their sin to him and say, I want you as my Savior, he won't say better than you do. I don't like the way you are. Come unto me. Come unto me. Sometimes, I think we Christians and churches think that we have a higher standard than Christ does. We discriminate. We discriminate. I hesitate in telling this, but it's been on my heart. A few weeks ago, our Friday morning breakfast, we men were sitting there and we would tell we're at the village and we could see out the windows there. There was a car that pulled up. And two young ladies got out of that car, and they were dressed in all black, and they had studs and all kinds of stuff all over. And they kept coming into the village and then going out. They came in the front door, so they didn't come where we were. But they came in the front door and going out, and we kind of shook our head and said, what are they up to? You know, and just the way we sometimes do when we see things like that. Two days later, those girls committed suicide. And I thought, my, instead of saying what we were doing, instead of judging them, shouldn't we have reached out to them? Yeah. Yeah. But we do that all the time, don't we? We see somebody, we hear somebody, even on TV, and we just say, ah, oh, look at them. Did Christ die for them? Sure he did. Do they need to be reached out to? Sure they do. And he's called upon us to do just that. The world can't resist an open heart. <clears throat> no. There are so many people out there this morning that are struggling, that don't even want to get out of bed today because their life is miserable, and it's terrible, and things that are going on in, in their life, and kids that are uh, teenagers, what are we doing? We're setting up boundaries. We're setting up barriers. We make walls. We do those kinds of things. How did Christ receive men? Look at verse 7. It says, Wherefore receive, receive, receive. He received them gladly, not reluctantly. God told us to be there for a hurting world. I mean, we, he didn't leave us here after we got saved. He did not take us to heaven just so that we could be here and, and, and you know, make money and enjoy all these kinds of things and so forth. That's not the reason he left us here. He left us here to reach a hurting world. And not just the pastor, not just the deacons, not the staff, every one of us. We are to reach out to a hurting world. Jesus gladly received all those who would come to him. He received them in spite of their imperfection. No one's perfect. Everyone's got flaws. Where would you be today if you hadn't got saved? What would you be doing? What would your life be like? Christ receives men without any kind of partiality. He receives them. In the latter part of verse 7, that, that kind of love brings glory to God. Glory to God. If you were to sit down and, and, and seriously talk to somebody else and say, Oh, I'd love to give God glory. I'd love to be able to give God glory. How can I do that? You know, when Christ received us, it brought glory to God. They said the heavens praised that. 
and we receive one another and together we praise Him. That gives God glory. God is thrilled when we go to another brother or sister or somebody that's not saved and share with them the love of Christ. Heaven rejoices over that. And we have that privilege, that responsibility. Well, it gives an illustration to that. Because Paul, when he makes a point, he illustrates it. Look at verse 8. Now I say that. Jesus Christ was a minister of circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. The point Paul makes is that we become one, and he uses the, the Bible to illustrate it. And you look at it two ways there in verse 8. He talks about the Old Testament prophecies there. He says the promises made unto the fathers. And then he talks about the person of Christ. Very clear. You know, the Jews thought the Gentiles were lacking to be a part of God's plan. I mean, we are the, we're God's people. We're the chosen one, the Jews said. And these Gentiles, just because they are getting saved, they think they could be, that we ought to be together. Paul's going to prove contrary to their thinking. In Genesis chapter 9, and verses 25 through 27, there's a prophecy there. And it talks about Gentile salvation. And it talks about this Gentile salvation. They are going to be connecting with Israel. You're going to be one. All of you Jews who get saved and all of the Gentiles who get saved, you will become one in me. That's what he's telling you. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was told that all nations, all nations were to be blessed. They're all going to be blessed. So Paul wants to say it is nothing new for the Gentiles to be a part of the grace that God has given to you Jews. It's there. You know, there in verse 8, it talks about the Old Testament to the fathers of Israel. Christ was the fulfillment of what, whatever God was going to do to all the people, both Old Testament, New Testament, Jews, Gentile. It is Jesus Christ who was the fulfillment for all mankind. Had Jesus not died on the cross, Jews and the Old Testament people would have been lost. But he did. He died. Look at verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto his name. He includes the Gentiles. God works with Israel and keeps all of his promises. God works with the Gentiles and keeps all of his promises. God says, I pray that they might be one. That's what Jesus prayer was. I pray that they might be one. Now he gives us four references to the Old Testament about the Gentile salvation and their belonging to Christ. Verse 9, again. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto this name. He's going back to Psalms chapter 18 and verse 49. Speaking through the psalmist, giving praise to God. And this is a picture of, of the Gentile salvation that's coming. It's prophetic. It's prophetic. He's trying to tell them, trying to show them that there's going to be a salvation for the entire world. Everybody. It's not just for the Jews. Verse 10. And again he said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 43. God, the Gentiles praising God with the Jews. You know what that's a preview of? The coming kingdom. Jews and Gentiles alike. We will all be in the kingdom. And you think about even today, when you look around the world, and you look at all the different nations and countries and, and languages and so forth, we're all going to be one praising God with the same voice, the same language. We will be praising God. Verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and want Him, all you people. It comes from Psalm 117 and verse 1. Everybody's going to be on, in on salvation. Anybody. God is not willing that any should perish. Anybody can get saved. Doesn't matter. Verse 12. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. The kingdom. Christ is going to rule over all. Jew and Gentile alike. All who are believers in Christ, He will rule over them. So you see, there's four Old Testament prophecies showing Christ belongs to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. 
Christ belongs to all men. Whoever will receive him, he belongs to them. We need to understand that. Sometimes we get in our own little, boy, I'm special. I'm really special. I'm God's favorite. That's not true. Well, we here in America, I mean, we are a Christian nation. We are really the one God blesses. Oh, he blesses all around the world. And he who will believe in him, he watch cares over them. He takes care of them. In fact, I think in some places, he's got to, he has to watch care over more than for us because of the situation they're in, the things that they have to go through. And they understand and see the power of God, the blessing of God, they watch care for them. They see that, they understand that. Christ belongs to all. Well, then he says, recognize your oneness in Christ. It comes in Ephesians chapter 2. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm sad for Justin not being able to get there into Ethiopia. He would have met some Ethiopians. Probably couldn't speak their language. Had to use an interpreter. But they were believers in Christ, and they were a brother, they were a sister in Christ. They were one in Christ. And same with us. Same with us. Christ is one in the Lord Paul. And his message simply is this. Accept him. Accept Jesus Christ. Well, he gives a little closing here, intercession in his closing, look at verse 13. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. There's the title. Look at that title. Underline, highlight it. God of hope. There's our only hope. He is the source of hope. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever's going on in this world, He is the hope. The only hope that we have. With that hope, He gives joy and He gives peace. Believe in Him. Receive His salvation. Understand that in your daily walk, whatever dark path you might have to walk through, He is there. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is with you always. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We need to understand that. He is the God of hope. But then we also need to realize there are a lot of people out there without any hope. What am I going to do? Where am I going to turn? Who's going to help me? What's tomorrow going to be like? Oh, we've got that message. We have the keys given to us to heaven. And we can share it. We need to share it. We ought to share it with somebody. And then the latter part of verse 13 there is just super abound in the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. Super abound in the Holy Ghost? What's stopping us? We are. We stop ourselves. We stop ourselves. I mean, what could a person do if he gave himself 100% over to Jesus Christ? What could he accomplish? What could he get done? How much glory could he give to God if he didn't give himself there? We live in a world that needs hope, joy, and peace that only Christ can give. All the peace that this world gives today is temporary. It might last a year, it might last a month, it might last a week, a day, an hour, a couple minutes. It's gone. It's gone. But the peace that we have in Jesus Christ never fades away. It is always there. The joy, the hope, the love. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning and thank you for giving Paul the book of Romans to give to us so that we can understand, realize, and be secure in what you want, how you want us to live, what you want us to do, how we can share, give, do. Thank you for that. Lord, yes, we look forward to it time that we're going to be with you in heaven. But while we're here on this earth, you've not left us. You've empowered us to be able to be Christ-like. May we do that. 
May we should do share love one with another. May we husbands love our wife as we love the church. And may we be willing to share that love. Thank you. Let's all stand together. As we stand together, we're going to sing from page 193, where he leads me. How about your life? Where he leads me. Can you sing that? As we sing.